Um, yes. Um, what um, quite a lot of our speakers have said is that there's a big heavy side on spending cuts and no detail about where they're going to cut or actually generate any of these. So what we've actually got in the um, last couple of weeks is we've actually had a document that's come out and they're telling us not what the cuts are going to be but how they're going to make the cuts. What can we say about this document? Well, it does look rather like a Gordon Brown style document, but that's actually quite good because it means none of our money, none of your money has gone on style consultants sort of redesigning all their documents. The other thing, however, is that there's 26 pages and seven of them are completely blank, which is a rather high degree of wastage for a waste-cutting document. Anyhow, um, let's see how they're going to do it. It's all about structures. Now, um, incredibly, Brown and Blair did try and control public expenditure. They controlled it the wrong way. I don't know how clear this is. There was a cabinet committee of ministers, about five to nine people over the period, and you had a split in public spending between what was called Dell and AME, De Amy Dell. Not a bad idea in itself. You had a three-year spending review. You had that sort of set a certain amount of control, and it sort of carried on. What was wrong? It was wrong because it was put in a very complicated document called a public spending agreement or a public service agreement, which meant that the Treasury got their hands on all the other departments. And you had the Cabinet Office coming along with all their targets, poking their nose in. This is where the, um, the target culture started. You end up with two very overpowerful departments like each other, and of course they didn't, so it was a bloody disaster. This is what we would have done if we'd won the election in 2005. It's quite a thank you, yeah. Um, the James Review. <laughs> right, now, it looks confusing, but trust me, I'm a solicitor. <laughs> we would have had a mixed committee of ministers, civil servants and advisers, and our job was in fact not to monitor these agreements, it was in fact to work out how are you going to generate your savings. That's me, I would have been in there. It was a virtual group, people drawn from other departments that were already sort of existing, no empire building, and we would have actually helped each of the departments to actually find and reinvent themselves. Key part of the system, the value for money officer in each department, he's a civil servant, he's a deputy secretary, which is sort of one group down from the permanent secretary. So it's somebody that knows where the filing cabinets are, knows what's in them, and more to the point, because he's in the department, he sticks with the consequences of his decisions. If he comes up with a bloody stupid way of buying paper clips, he has to carry it out. So there's a sort of a trust element. And human nature being what it is, deputy secretaries all want to be permanent secretaries. And if their chances of becoming permanent secretaries are based on their ability to find savings, they will find savings. Structures matter. This is what the coalition is doing. Now, it's actually quite similar. The one that everyone's picked up on is that members of the public, that's you, who are paying for all of this, are being invited to come up with your bright ideas. It's a bit sort of googly zeitgeist, but actually it's rubbish, because what this means is we've got, a, we've got a spending freeze. We can't recruit people from the outside and bring in lots of expensive consultants. Those are the people who would have been in the taxpayer value unit under the James Review. So I suspect that uh, Mr. Osborne knows exactly which members of the public are going to spontaneously volunteer their ideas already. Um, the Efficiency and Reform Group is presumably something from the Treasury, might be in the Cabinet Office. It will make quite a difference as to how successful it is to where it goes. Um, what will happen? Well, now we've got a committee, but it's only a committee of ministers. They've split out the permanent secretaries and the civil servants in a separate list. Don't like that. Five ministers, um, Osborne and Alexander from the Treasury, that's sensible. You've got uh, Letwin and Maud from the Cabinet Office, that's sensible. The fifth man, who's almost certainly got the balance of power, is Haig. Now, why is the Foreign Secretary on this public spending committee? Because Mr. Haig has two jobs. He is also the first Secretary of State, which is why he's got twice as many special advisors as any other cabinet minister. Now, that's interesting because the first Secretary of State is usually the official title of the Deputy Prime Minister. Have we got a government with two Deputy Prime Ministers? Also, it probably suggests that Mr. Haig is being lined up as David Cameron's Willie Whitelaw. So, that's what will happen is your departments will come up here. It's actually sort of pretty similar to the James Review, but the other change, apart from separating out the permanent secretaries, is the man who now has to find the savings is a minister. This is a bad idea because he doesn't know what the hell is going on in the filing cabinets and two years from now he's going to be reshuffled. Also, I rather like the idea that all ministers are meant to be getting value for money, not just one of them. There you go. Right, so when we were drawing up the James Review, we came up with various principles. 
it's no good just sort of um, coming up with a brilliant set of ideas. What we're actually after is we're after a culture change. We want Sir Humphrey to become a value for money minister himself. So you've got to have a sort of a genuine culture change. And uh, the requirement of that is you've actually got to have consistent political leadership. You don't want the Prime Minister and the Chancellor briefing against each other, and you don't want the Cabinet Secretary briefing against both of them. You want them working together, driving it through. But the crucial point is, it's actually got to work inside the departments. You've got to break down the idea of an us-them culture. If you parachute in change from outside, it doesn't work, because they'll just sit down and wait for you to be voted out. So that was the three principles of change. Now, what have they told us about their principles for change? Well, they haven't, actually. But they've given us a list of criteria. When it comes up to their committee, they will review it with these questions, and they will say, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? Are we going to spend the money? And then they'll sort of have an arm wrestling competition. In itself, not a bad idea. So we can sum up. The coalition, we can say it scores well. They have started off with something which looks rather like the James Review, which is a good thing, because it's sort of the first serious outside review of value for money in government. So that means that either they found my file from five years ago, or they've got somebody else advising them who's come up with exactly the same ideas, which means I was right. So, and we were mocked at the time, but remember, what we were doing was we were generating savings to pay down debt. We'd worked out five years ago that we were running out of money already. So, one to me. So that's a kind of very sort of thing. There we are. They're asking the right questions. That criteria list is exactly right. And they've also, and it's in here, they've worked out that there is a problem within Whitehall that they can't control how they actually spend money. So they're going to try and beef up the finance director function within each department, which is quite right. When you have a department, for example, like DEFRA, which is sort of uh, just a joke, frankly. I mean, no one's got any ideas. They're better at herding sheep than sort of looking after your money. And I think sort of they're now actually going to try and strengthen that function, which is good. So we can give them a cheer. Where do we have to keep an eye on things? Well, is this structure robust enough? Separating out the civil servants and the ministers doesn't add anything to a system that's trying to drive, drive a sort of cultural change within, um, within Whitehall. I, I don't believe the evil Sir Humphrey theory. Sir Humphrey ends up running the country when nobody else is. So if you've got a good prime minister and a good cabinet, then Sir Humphrey does as he's told. And I suspect that actually most of the savings they'll find will be volunteered from the civil service, because at the end of the day, nobody likes working for a NAF failing organization. But there is a risk that you can start having playing off one department against another. The minister may say, well, actually, I, I can't deal with that, because you know, my permanent secretary is dealing with that through the permanent secretary's committee. And the permanent secretary will say, well, I can't do that at all. That's a matter for the minister. I suspect the cabinet secretary has told them that they are not implicating the civil service in their decisions. They can go and find their own bloody savings. And that's possibly a reaction against the Blair era, when they had special advisors telling civil servants. Or it might be that there is a scope to sort of have resistance. So it may not be too robust. As I say, if there's a reshuffle, they're in trouble. Have they overcome the us-them problem is the real problem, I think. And we don't know. We will find out when we see where these savings are coming from and how much there are. I think there's, um, there was something, uh, Ted Heath, um, uh, a note for younger listeners, he was, um, he was a prime minister during the 1970s, and you don't really want to copy what he did. But um, he had a thing called PAR, which was a, it was a sort of a cost control mechanism called policy analysis and review, uh, and it total disaster. And it didn't work because it was all decided top down and imposed on the civil service. There is a document written by Derek Rayner which is coming up for declassification in the new year, in January, which explains why it failed. It will be a fascinating document which none of you will ever read, but it's worth checking on that because if they've learned the lessons from that, it, we will find out whether this program is going to work. So the question that I just left at the end, what happens when recovery comes? They will make savings because there isn't any money. You can't spend money, people won't borrow or won't lend to you. But if when the, you know, sort of the storm is passed, we end up with an unreformed, non-value-for-money culture. What will happen is Topsy will then start growing again. So that's what we need to do. We need to actually reform the system. We need to have a culture change, and the structure matters. Thank you.